Uh, thanks, Victor, for filling in, and he also wasn't feeling well today, so he uh, deserves an award for, for getting here. So thanks a lot. Um, so our next speaker is Younghui Kwan, and uh, he's going to talk about A A2C, a self-destructing exploit executions via input perturbation. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Yong Yiguan. Uh, this work is uh, joint work with Purdue University and uh, University of Georgia. So uh, let me start the talk with our key observation. So uh, to come up with a general solution, we analyze a bunch of uh, attacks and exploits. And we, we observe this. In most attacks, attackers need to inject malicious payload. And uh, these malicious payloads are brittle. So let me give you an example. Here is an attacker and a program. Usually, attacker first sends a malicious input to a program to uh, trigger a vulnerability. And then he sends a malicious payload, uh, which is a set of operation that he wants to execute on the program. And usually, they are shellcode or ROP gazette. And then we analyze this shellcode and ROP gazette to understand. And we find that this, these are so brittle. So any little mutation on this shellcode or ROP gazettes will completely break their semantics. Uh, let me give you an example. On the left side, I have a um, hex representation of the shell code. And on the right side, this is the uh, corresponding x86 instruction of the shell code. Then I just apply uh, XOR with AA and see what happens. Here we see the different numbers from 31 to 9B. And more importantly, uh, for the con corresponding instruction, we see completely different semantics. Uh, previously, we see XOR, push, pop. Now we see uh, F weight and push, uh, pop. So we can see the payload is totally broken. But the problem is if we change these inputs in this way, uh, then what about the benign execution? So we need to preserve uh, benign execution correctly. So let me give you an example how we do it. And uh, we first start with a simple input, which is HTTP request with a post and index.php. PHP and uh, HTTP version. As, as soon as we get this data, we first encode uh, by subtracting uh, one to each byte. And when the program wants to uh, parse and process this input, we take this encoded input and then uh, decode it and give it back to the program so that we can assure uh, benign execution uh, will be done correctly. So this web server process all this input with our decoder, and then produce the output. So we build a system on top of this observation. So uh, every input from untrusted sources, we first encode these inputs, and we get the encoded inputs. And later, a program will only interact with this encoded input. So if an attacker wants to exploit, and then the payload is also encoded, so attack naturally fails. But if program wants to read and parse to a benign execution. Then we decode this input, and we get the decoded input, and uh, we give this back to the program so that we can assure a benign execution. So at this point, you may have a natural question. Why the malicious payloads are not decoded? Because essentially, we are doing, uh, certainly we are doing uh, some decoding at some point. So let me give you an, uh, an answer. First, we decode based on uh, input processing semantics, which means that we statically analyze a program and decode when the inputs are used by the program as intended data. Uh, so essentially, it's our assumption is inputs should be the data, not the code. So we allow inputs to be accessed as intended type of data, but it will, we will break if data, I mean, these are the code. Uh, or unintended types of, uh, types of the data, for example, Rob gazes. So let's uh, look at the big picture. Uh, this is the overview of, of our system. So we have the first original uh, program, and we have program analysis, which consists of two parts. Uh, the first one is constraint solving, and the second part is static analysis. And then we uh, instrument the program. Uh, we get, then we get the instrumented program, uh, and with the uh, runtime support in it. 
So now uh, let's, uh, ex let me explain the program analysis part in detail. So the most important and difficult question in our system is when to encode and when to decode. So the first when to encode is we essentially encode all incoming, uh, incoming inputs from untrusted sources. For example, receive from the network or read from untrusted files. And we decode when the encoded values are consumed by the program. Uh, uh, consumed by the uh, program's input processing logic. But what is the input processing logic? To answer that question, we analyze the program and what they are doing with the inputs. For example, uh, programs copies uh, inputs here and there, and also sometimes read and compare, which we say is parsing. And uh, they do conversion. For example, they convert uh, ASCII to Unicode, and also they do computations to generate outputs. But in our perspective, uh, the question, the important question is, uh, al al along these uh, operations, what kind of operation is safe to decode when uh, assuming that uh, these inputs are encoded and also probably malicious? So the first copy operation, we shouldn't decode because imagine that this encoded input uh, may have the malicious payload. Then if we decode, we are essentially helping the attackers. We will decode the malicious inputs and spread all over the memory. So the first one is clear, we shouldn't decode. But the second one, uh, we found that uh, read and compare is safe to decode because when the program uh, read and compare, they first uh, get a small copy of the uh, data onto the register and then compare and uh, after a few instructions, it will uh, just clear it out. So we say uh, this one is clear, we can decode. But the last two parts, uh, conversions and computations, are difficult to answer because some of the conversion and computations are simple enough, so they are essentially similar to copy, but some of them are not. Uh, let me give you an example. Here is one operation, and if attacker send A and they get X, and the next time if attacker gets uh, sends a B and gets Y, in this case, essentially, by attacker can control the output of this operation by controlling their input. So we say this one attackers still have control after this operation. So essentially, in this case, we shouldn't decode. But here is another uh, example. Uh, if an attacker send A, it gets one. If attacker send B and it gets one, then it means that no matter what they do, they will get, always get one. So we are saying this one probably safe to decode. But it's hard to answer uh, for a lot of cases, especially the computation is complex. Uh, so, because we are not sure, we decide to ask constraint solver. So, let me give you an example. Here is a small program and uh, has uh, three buffers. So, the first buffer, M7, is unsigned in, and the second and third, are IMG and NPR, are unsigned short. And this program has little computation within two loop. Uh, essentially, it does what it does is M7 equals IMG minus NPR. To ask the constraint server, we need to understand their language and transform our things to their language. So this is how we do. So first, we model uh, their operation. So M we first uh, say M7 equals MGR minus NPR is essentially repeat. And uh, we encode, uh, remember that IMG and NPR was unsigned short, so essentially we are encoding uh, the range of unsigned short uh, in this form. And the last part is the most important part. We now assert uh, whether M7 can be one of the payload. Essentially, the payload is an array that contains a possible payload uh, like numbers. So we uh, actually collect this payload from various sources, and uh, this is essentially how we model uh, distribution of possible payload. So we have large payload pool collected by various sources uh, as big as uh, 1.4 gigabyte. And uh, then we ask, uh, okay. Uh, then uh, we use G3 server as a constraint server. And then we collect uh, payload from exploit database, meta exploit, and we use Rob Gazette, Robber tools, and sharestorm.org. And we even uh, de disassemble all the uh, existing Linux binary uh, to uh, understand a possible shellcode. 
And also, finally, we also use a random number generator because shell code can be very uh, different. So uh, we right, even use the uh, random number generator. So uh, we ask constraint servers, and we can get uh, some returns. First, send means uh, constraint server find the answer, means that attacker can construct some payload after some complex computation. The second one, timeout, means that it tries to solve something, but it cannot finish within the given amount of time. And the third one, unknown, means that the computation is not implemented in the constraint server, so it give up to give an answer. So the second timeout and third one, essentially, uh, the meaning is we don't know. So we take the conservative uh, position and say attackers might have some control. But uh, if constraint server says unset, this means that given our payload, uh, attacker have no control uh, on this operation. That means this is the operation uh, we can safely decode. So now we can get back to uh, this operation and we can uh, give some answers. Depending on the answers from the constraint server, we find that uh, conversions are uh, not safe to decode. And some simple computations are also not safe to decode, so we shouldn't decode. Uh, and there are also certain complex computation uh, which we can safely decode based on uh, the answer from the GIS resolver. So based on this information, we define a new term which is decoding frontier, means that this is the operation which is fairly complex enough uh, which change the values significantly so that after this operation, attacker lose control of the, of the output. So uh, we, we split the program space into two space. One, uh, before the decoding frontier, we call exploitable space, which means that attacker has the control over the buffer so that they can construct the uh, payload. So we need to keep all the values uh, encoded. And after the decoding frontier, we say post-exploit space uh, means that after this uh, decoding frontier, attacker lose control, so we are uh, safe to decode uh, the values. So now all this information, uh, we instrument the program. Uh, so we put uh, encoding and decoding functions. So uh, the encoding function, uh, we will put all uh, untrusted sources, for example, receive and read. And uh, interestingly, we found that we also need to encode some of the const constants more. Uh, this is quite fun to uh, read and uh, details in the paper. And uh, we need to put the decode uh, when encoded values are consumed by the program's input processing logic, which we just covered. And now we, we can also say uh, we can even decode permanently at the decoding frontier. Okay, now uh, we will show some of the evaluation result. Uh, we evaluate our performance with the 18 real world applications and we got the 6% uh, overhead. And for the spec CPU 2006, we get 8% and we get a little bit higher overhead on uh, input uh, sensitive uh, programs. And overall we have uh, six, almost 7% uh, overhead. Uh, and also we uh, evaluate uh, effectiveness of our mutation technique. And we uh, test 23 different exploits on 18 programs, and we prepare 100 payload, half of them are shell code, half of them are WAP payload for each program. And we apply XOR with X, uh, AA on this shell code and WAP gadget and see uh, how many instructions and WAP gadget can be executed. So we found that uh, only three or four instructions uh, in the shell code can be executed, but the thing is, uh, these are already mutated and their, mean, uh, their semantic is sort of meaningless. And we see uh, almost none, just uh, 0.1 uh, average number of rock dodges are executed. So uh, we can say uh, mutation will break the malicious payload execution and it will actually uh, break way earlier. 
Uh, here is some discussions on uh, limitation of our technique. Uh, essentially, uh, we are talking about attacks in the post-exploit space. Uh, this is because uh, when we compute the decoding frontier, we model the uh, distribution of uh, this payload using uh, we, uh, the data we concretely collect from the uh, meta exploit or uh, these sources. So if that model is broken, then we can say attacks in post-exploit space is possible. And also the attacker uh, can, can use the memory disclosure to know the encoding method and the key uh, we used. But we argue that because we are using a different key every uh, different key to encode for each buffer and each request, knowing the previous key uh, of the buffer does not help in the subsequent attacks. So uh, we have a lot of related works it's like CFI, uh, malicious payload detection, randomization, uh, bound checkers. Uh, these, great, uh, these are all the great uh, related works. And uh, our tool is complementary to these tools so that we can uh, be used with them to protect the system more secure. So uh, here is uh, our conclusion. Uh, we provide a general protection against the wide spectrum of uh, payload injection attack. Potentially, we can prevent uh, some unknown attack vectors too. And uh, so essentially, for malicious inputs, we, uh, the execution will uh, break and uh, it even breaks earlier. And for benign inputs, we assure that the program executes correctly. Uh, the way we do is we use the key idea is we encode inputs and decode uh, encoded ones depending on the input processing semantics. Uh, and also we, uh, we show that we prevent our payload injection attacks with uh, low overhead. And this concludes my talk, and thanks for listening. And uh, I'm happy to get any questions.